So I'd like to say that we are extremely privileged to have some, some awesome speakers here this evening from CHIO, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Leanne Ward, who will be speaking to us about muscle and bone health in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. Dr. Ward is a research chair in pediatric bone health, associate professor, faculty of medicine, University of Ottawa, pediatric bone health clinical <coughs> research programs, CHEO, and Canadian Institutes for Health Research investigator, and child health clinician scientist. I uh, would like to ask Dr. Ward to please come to the podium, and we will have a five minute question and answer period following Dr. Ward's presentation. for the opportunity to speak tonight. This is just an incredibly inspiring evening and I'm delighted to be and honored to be part of it. And I want to share with you that as a clinician and a clinician scientist, I very much appreciated working with the Division of Gastroenterology at Chino and the families with IBD. It's been, a, as I said, a real honor to, to learn from the families and learn through research going forward. So what I'd like to do uh, first is just to acknowledge the funding for some of the work that you're going to hear about tonight. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America has funded most of the work, but also the CHEO Research Institute and the Shriners of North America. So I'm going to be talking about bone health, and you'll see that that's related to muscle health and inflammatory bowel disease. And essentially the issue is that bone mass, the amount of bone and bone density, bone thickness are often reduced or low in children with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly those with Crohn's disease. And bone fragility, where the bones actually break easily, has been described in this condition as well. And that's called osteoporosis. So what is osteoporosis? It essentially means holes in the bone. It's a bone disorder that causes loss of bone strength, which predisposes to an increased risk of fracture. And is that, as you can see on the right, there's large holes in the bone, and, and the bone is a little bit splintered compared to the healthy sample on the left. Now, in my experience running the Bone Health Clinic at CHEO, on occasion we do see children present with bone fragility, and it can either manifest as frequent fractures of the arms and the legs, or fractures of the spine. And this is an example of a boy on the right who had poorly controlled Crohn's disease. Uh, he was in a country where there wasn't good access to care before coming to Canada. The disease was very poorly controlled for a very long time, and he presented with these fractures in the spine. On the left, the bones are healthy, so normally they're very square. On the right, you see the bones are flattened because they're soft. And his bone density picture on the right, the dark line is average, and he's way below which just means the bones are very thin. So that's the clinical problem that I'm talking about, osteoporosis in this setting. Now, there was very little research and understanding on this area 10 years ago when I first started to work with Dr. Max. So when I went to the medical literature, there wasn't a lot of understanding about what causes osteoporosis in women with their clinical bowel disease. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> we all have our challenges. <laughs> Thanks. It's good to be able to see you all now. So. I'd love a point or two again. <laughs> and a glass of wine. <laughs> understand what's going on, what causes the problem, and how we can make it better. So we often think of starting research on it ourselves, basically to push things forward, and that's what I did in collaboration with Dr. Mack and the Division of Gastroenterology. And what we decided to do was to take the children when they were under general anesthesia for their diagnostic endoscopy, so when they were having their biopsy to prove that they had Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, we decided to take advantage of that short anesthesia that they were having and take a little piece of bone from the hip and look at it under the microscope because that is the very best way to see what's going on with the skeleton is to actually look at the bone. And so we were able to study 20 children uh, for that purpose and I'm grateful for the families who participated in that study. And so you can see here on the left that there's a little trocar that goes right through the hip bone, the iliac crest, and gives us a full length uh, picture of the bone. 
So what did we learn? Well, at diagnosis with inflammatory bowel disease, we already saw issues with the bone tissue. We saw that the cortices, so if you look at the upper panel, the outside of the bone is very thick compared to the panel on the bottom. And we saw when we looked at different parameters that the bone appeared very sleepy, very shut down. Normally the pediatric bone is very dynamic. It's, uh, it's, it's moving, it's regenerating, and the bone was just asleep. And we think that that was because TNF-alpha, which is the cytokine that's produced by the gut that gives the symptoms, was also affecting the bone tissue. So we know that in children, muscle strength drives bone development, and Clinton spoke about having a passion for soccer and holding on to that and being active. And our research would suggest that that's actually very important in Crohn's disease for bone health. We know that in children, muscle strength drives bone development in all children. The stronger the muscles, the stronger the bones. And we've shown through our research program that muscles are thin in children with Crohn's disease. And we don't think it's just because they're less active. We think that the cytokines that make the gut sick are also making the muscles sick. So just to show you an example of what can happen in an extreme form when the muscles don't work, this is not Crohn's disease, this is polio, but it just shows you what can go on. This is a girl who's 19 years of age and developed polio, which is paralysis of the limb, of the, of the left limb at 18, of the right rather, at 18 months of age. And you can see on her left that the bone is much, much thinner than on the healthy side where she had normal muscle development. So it's, there's no question that healthy muscles build healthy, healthy bones. And since muscle development stimulates bone development, then we hypothesized that a lack of muscle development was probably playing a key role in the bone mass deficit that we were consistently observing in children with Crohn's disease. And the medical term for low muscle mass is sarcopenia, so you may hear me refer to that. So what causes thin muscles in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Well, the potential causes would be a lack of nutrition, and so just a wasting away, as Clinton spoke about. When you waste away due to a lack of nutrition, both your fat and your muscle mass are reduced, fat and muscle. But in Crohn's disease, what's been shown is that the fat mass is actually preserved relatively. It's the muscle mass that really thins and, and, and weakens over time. So we think that that, as I said, is inflammatory cytokines that are produced by the gut actually attacking the muscles and then giving rise to a lack of bone strength. So we did a little study to understand what the muscles are doing in children and teenagers with Crohn's disease. And essentially we wanted to measure how weak the muscles were and then what the bones adjacent to the muscles look like. We also wanted to understand how often those fractures in the spine occur because there was no data on that. So we just finished up a study actually, again in collaboration with Dr. Mack and the Division of Gastroenterology, where we, uh, oh, there you go, you really do deliver, don't you? <laughs> yeah, just waiting for the wine. <laughs> so did anyone participate in this study, this the jumping study, the PQCT study? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You're going to hear about what we learned from the cohort in general. So we enrolled children between 6 and 18 years of age through the pediatric, identified through the pediatric IBD clinic, and we enrolled them between 2008 and 2012. All the children had confirmed Crohn's disease. And we really targeted Crohn's because it seems that the bone problems are more marked in Crohn's compared to ulcerative colitis. And Dr. Mack measured for us the disease activity index, which is a measure of how severe the disease was in each child. We've actually enrolled 75 children, and we're pretty much uh, coming up to our limit. I have data on 67 for you analyzed for tonight, and the mean age of diagnosis was 13, which is what you would expect in an IBD cohort, I understand from Dr. Mack, and 62% were boys. Most of the children, 91%, had moderate or severe Crohn's, which is often how the children come when they present. They come in, in, in pretty bad shape, my understanding is. They're very sick. And so that is reflected in our data that 90% of them had a moderate or severe disease index. And what we saw, again, which is not surprising, is that they were uh, a little bit on the shorter side. 
because of their underlying disease, that they were thinner, which is what you would expect, that their bone density was lower than the healthy average. And even when we corrected their bone density for their size, because bone density measurements are size dependent, if you're short, you have a lower bone density than if you're tall. Even when we corrected for short stature and, and low weight, um, we found that the bone density was still low. To measure how strong the muscles were, we did something called jumping mechanography, which I think was sort of fun, in, the, in a sense, fun for the children. So they stood on a force plate which measured the speed of the jump, the height of the jump, the power of the jump, and they basically were told to jump as high as possible and then stick the landing like a gymnast. And then the other thing we did was a very special test that measures bone density of the leg and the child sits comfortably in a chair and their foot goes in what's called a gantry and then we take a slice, a picture of their bone at different parts all along the lower leg or the tibia. So we measured the bone density and the bone area uh, close to the ankle and then we go up closer to the knee where the muscle is maximal. So if you grab your calf muscle right where it's biggest that's closer to the knee, and we were interested in how thick the muscle was and what the bone looked like beside the muscle. Now, I'm going to interpret all this for you, but just to tell you what we did is we took all the children and teenagers with Crohn's disease results, and we compared them to age and gender matched healthy controls, is, is the medical term. So this would be if a child had a score here along this red line, that would mean that they were no different than a child without Crohn's disease. If the group's values were below the line, that means that they had low values. If they were above the line, that means they had high values. And so basically, just to interpret that uh, for you, we found that children had uh, weaker legs overall, about 18% weaker in terms of their ability to jump at diagnosis compared to healthy controls. Their muscles were much thinner, about 20%. Thinner, and their bones adjacent to the muscles were also thinner by about 20%. We also showed that the bones were not undergoing rejuvenation. So we rejuvenate our nails and our hair. We replace it every so often. We actually replace our skeleton too. The skeleton you're walking on today as an adult is different than the one you were walking on 10 years ago. It's literally been replaced. And in kids, the replacement rate is even higher. What we, were, we found is that the bones were not undergoing rejuvenation as they should be. Older bone was hanging around in these children. And then finally we were able to tell from all these different measurements that the bone, the muscle, and bone deficits were recent. They hadn't been going on for very long, uh, which fits with children getting access to care quickly and, and getting diagnosed. And then the other thing that we showed was just how often these fractures in the spine occur. So we did a spine x-ray in all of the children at diagnosis. We found that about 29% of the children had back pain, but only one child, less than 2%, had a fracture in the spine. So this is good news, actually. Although I've seen spine fractures in clinic, it's actually a very rare complication of Crohn's disease in terms of bone health. To give you an idea, we see about a 16% spine fracture rate in children with leukemia. We see about a 7% rate in children with arthritis. So in Crohn's disease, it, it looks even lower. It looks like the intestinal inflammation targets mostly the muscles, and for the most part, leaves the spine alone. And this is just an example of the one patient who did have spine fractures. You can see that the bones in the back, which should be square, are a little bit triangular here because they're soft and they just compress. So to summarize what we found, we found that leg muscles were thin and weak in children with recently diagnosed Crohn's disease, that leg weakness was associated with loss of bone strength and evidence that the bones were not refreshing themselves or rejuvenating like they should, and the frequency of these spine fractures was low overall, which was good news. So where are we going from here? Well, children and teenagers have a phenomenal capacity to recover from bone density and muscle deficit. So we actually want to understand how children who are receiving quality IBD care at CHEO, to what extent they can go on and recover their muscle strength and recover their bone strength. So we have, we're seeking funding for following these 75 children who we studied at diagnosis further along. There's a study from Germany that suggests that the deficit may persist to some extent for up to five years after diagnosis. 
Now that's with German care. We want to understand what it's like with Canadian care because we know that treating the underlying disease is instrumental in making the muscles and bones as healthy as possible. We think that treatment, literally treatment with physical activity, using physical activity as a medicine, if you will, or an intervention, once children are well, is a logical next step. Obviously, when a child is very, very sick at diagnosis or having a relapse later, you can't get them doing vigorous exercise. But we think that physical activity should be part of the care plan for children with IVD, and we're actually hoping at some point to do an official physical activity study. But to hear um, these two individuals talk about their pursuits and the endurance that was required and the muscle strength, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that I think we'd like to see from a medical perspective as well as from an emotional and moral perspective. Um, sometimes for individuals with very fragile bone, we have to use a bone strengthening medication and Dr. Mack and his colleagues will refer such a child to me for that uh, indication. And I just want to instill some, some, some hope and, and inspiration from a bone perspective as well. This just speaks to the tremendous potential of the child to reshape and rebuild bone. This is the boy that came from the, uh, the country with poor care. Uh, for a number of years and had multiple spine fractures and he went on with a bone strengthening medication to literally rebuild his spine. The bones got denser and they reshaped so they're square again. So children, if you treat them early, can really uh, recover very nicely and his bone density went from being his boots to being average with a little bit of help with the bone strengthening medication. And sometimes the children can do this all on their own without any help if they can get their Crohn's disease well under control. So what are the take home messages that I'd like to leave with, with you from the perspective of a, of a clinician and also from the research that we've been doing? I would suggest that teens and children with IBD should be encouraged to be as active as possible, obviously within the limits of, of the condition and with approval of their IBD doctor, but I think this is absolutely key. Any child should be active, and I think if you're battling a chronic illness, it's important to try not to lose that aspect. It's important to report back pain to a healthcare provider and to pay attention to other strategy, strategies that will help maintain health levels like calcium and vitamin D. And I know the TOIBD clinic has a very nice nutritional program that takes very good care of that aspect. And then uh, at the, in the GOIBD clinic as well, there's a mechanism to refer patients to me if there is a need for bone health monitoring and bone health care. And so we just encourage you to, to follow those recommendations if they are needed in a, in a subset of children. So I'd like to just again acknowledge the, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America who funded this particular study that I told you about, all the patients and families who participated, and I'm so delighted that some of you are here so that you can actually hear about the results and what we were able to learn and what your child's participation and effort has meant to our understanding. Uh, this study would not be possible, obviously, without Dr. David Mack's collaboration and Eric Benchmall, Janice Barkey, Mark Boland, Carolina Jimenez and uh, some of my other colleagues at TU as well. And this is my team. So many of the families that participated in the study will know my team members, uh, particularly Heather Cosgrove, who takes the children through the paces of the study, Josie McLennan, and uh, Scott Walker, who does the bone density testing. So you'll recognize some of these personnel who help to carry out these research studies. That's it. Yes, my daughter is here, and she's provided the last slide for us tonight. <laughs> so I look forward to your questions. <laughs>